So I think we've got um, more or less the uh, the usual agenda today. So we, we run through um, any particular um, PRs and issues um, that we want to discuss. So if there's any that people want to discuss, feel free to add them to the list there. And then likewise for any um, outstanding proposals. Um, and then we've got the issues triage and then any other business. So I'll make a start with um, just the one PR we've got listed here, which is uh, my own one. Um, it's about the unidirectional topic operator. Um, so I know that uh, this has received um, some comments already that I'm hoping to uh, start addressing tomorrow. And I know that um, Paolo is planning to look at it soon. But if anyone else wants to take a look at that, it would be uh, great. This is quite a large rewriting of the existing topic operator. Um, so, as you can see there from the, uh, the diff stat, there's uh, quite a few new lines of code going on there, so the more eyes we get on that, the better. But any comments about that before I move on? Okay, so unless there are any other um, PRs or issues, then I'll move on to the proposals. Okay, so the only um, sort of proposal that I, I picked out as being worthy of discussion, we do have some older um, proposals which are sort of kind of stalled for various reasons, but this is a, a recent one um, which I think is still seeing a little bit of um, review. I've not um, had a chance to review it recently, so I'm hoping to go back and take a look at that probably tomorrow morning. Um, so I don't know if uh, anyone has got anything in particular they want to discuss there. I think it's sort of making progress, but like I say, I need to take a look at this and catch up with uh, what's going on. But does anyone have anything that they want to um, talk about this particular one, server side apply? Okay, while well, hearing nothing about server-side apply, um, we can move on to the issues triage. Uh, I think I've already got the, the list here. I'll just refresh it in case there are any more. Um, so we'll start at the top and see where we go. So this is one that's come up um, previously um, about um, using node selectors at the pod level. I think we were after a little bit more sort of motivation for this one. And we've asked a couple of times. So unless anyone um, in the meeting can sort of provide motivation or additional context, then I propose that we uh, close this um, for now. Uh, and the author can always uh, reopen it if they're willing to provide that, that background. Does that seem reasonable to people? Yes. Okay. So moving on to the next one. Um, this is uh, one that I think Kyle has been looking at. Is Kyle on the call today? Yes, he is. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, so I continued some of this conversation with the ECA 
while flying. Um, and so we decided, or at least to, to move forward with the suggestion, basically when um, requests, when CPU requests are not equal to the limits or the requests are set and the limits are not set, um, we use the requests as the cruise control CPU limit um, as per the reasons that Jakob mentioned in the uh, problem above. It seemed to be kind of make the most sense. So it's, the, it's an easy change um, and it's a lot more sane than what we currently have for the default. Okay, so just to summarize then, this is the short term recommendation. Uh, Yes, short-term recommendation, yes. Okay, so you, is this something you're planning to work on um, yourself? Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I can throw it in, it wouldn't be, it's trivial, so yeah, you can you can put me on or I'll, I'll sign it to someone else who wants to I'll sign it for you for now. And you can always unassign yourself, so. So I just I'll just paste it. Let's see. Okay, is that a reasonable summary? Yep, that that's fine. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, I think this is one that I've seen before as well about XX properties and the, I think it's the unlock diagnostic VM options, which has to be, unlike this about every other JVM option that has to be before any of the uh, options that it unlocks. Um, is I think the, the gist of the problem here. And um, when we've looked at this before, we, uh, we kind of hoped that if we, because the JSON library that we use, something called um, Jackson, uh, can preserve the order of items in a, a hash. But I think um, Federico's shown that the problem's really inside Kube, which is just seeing JSON and not preserving the order. Um, so we can't use that as a workaround. And we've had the suggestion um, that we just special case the unlock diagnostic VM options, which I think will work, given my understanding of um, yeah how the the JVM passes its options, which I don't think it's necessarily guaranteed by any spec to always work. But I think in practice, if we did this, um, it would solve the problem for this user. So um, I'm interested in sort of hearing people's thoughts and opinions about that. But currently, my suggestion is that we do that because it should be fairly simple as to see if it's in the list and if it is move it to the front but if we do this it will be another list of prioritized parameters to maintain right so it's not something that you set today and it will be always working but you're not guaranteed me at the point that we generate the list of command line arguments, I'm suggesting we do it there. So I can't remember off the top of my head um, whether that would be happening inside mm. the broker container at runtime or whether this is something that we can do um, when we're preparing the um, environment and so forth for the container within the cluster operator. But it shouldn't get reordered after that point. It won't be going through any sort of JSON serialization, I mean. Does that make sense? Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, I don't know if how will this kind of work, so.
I see the user also suggests to do this, to make it configurable, uh, but we already have a workaround. I mean, using templates, you can set the JVM flags. That it is mentioned uh, uh, in the thread. Yeah, no, I realize there's a, a workaround for this, but I still think it it's probably worth doing just mm -hmm. just for ease of use, really. Okay. I mean, unless you strongly disagree, or you know, it'd be interesting no, if no. anyone else has got strong feelings about this, but it just doesn't seem to me like that this is that hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it turns out that. I mean, I've not looked at the, the bash scripts because um, I'm you know, not doing an awful lot of uh, scrimsy development at the moment. So um, maybe it is harder than I think, but I suspect it's just a, a few lines of bash to, to do this. So. That seem reasonable. Yeah. And uh, do we want to mark this as um, not wanted? Yeah, I think it's also a good start, right? With just I think it could be, yeah, because if I'm right, then it is just you know a little bit of bash scripting, which you know doesn't yeah. sort of require extensive knowledge of how some of the operators or Kafka works. So mm -hmm. agree. So on to the next one. Um, I don't know, we've got Paolo on the call today. So, I mean, this does seem fairly reasonable. Having, you know, sort of the, the context for why things are, are stopping and starting is normally pretty helpful for people.
Again, does that seem a reasonable um, sort of response there? I'm not hearing anything to the. Yes. Go on, Freddie. It's fine to me. I'm not sure that's quite a um, good start, but I think that could be a, a help wanted. Yes. Again, it's tricky to know for sure without Paolo being here. We'll proceed on that basis. He can always change it if he disagrees. So this is one, I think, um, Jacob's, I don't know if it came out of the, uh, the code review from the node pool PR, which has been merged this week. Um, but this seems like it's a, a clear benefit with no real downsides. Um, so the idea here, I think, is that we put the Kafka cluster ID in the status, that we've already got it in the status of the Kafka CR. Um, but now we've got the addition of node pools, we would put the uh, the cluster ID in the state of the node pool CR and validate them before we start acting on those CRs because um, with node pools we end up sort of needing to look at the, the node pool specs and the Kafka spec and then, you know, the operator makes changes based on those. So having some way to, to validate that the labels haven't got changed by accident. And then, yeah, we're sort of accidentally operating on the, the wrong node pool um, and you know, potentially causing a, a disaster. Um, it seems like it's a clear win to me. I think this is Thoughts? also mentioned in, in the proposal, right? It's yeah. Kind of okay. Twenty twenty three rather than twenty oh three. Thank you. And I suspect this is something that um, Jacob might work on himself, actually. So I'll leave that comment. Okay, so I think this is um, really a, a request for an improved Helm chart that includes configuring the, the pod disruption budget, which is not unreasonable. Um, the sort of the issue that we've sort of had within the Strimsy community is that nobody is um, particularly um, keen on maintaining the, the Helm charts. I think that many of the the developers of Strimzio just um, installing things using the the YAML files. Um, 
and other people are using the um, installing through the uh, I've forgotten the name. The heat well, setting to me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the uh, operator lifecycle management stuff. Um, and so the Helm sort of method of uh, installation tends to fall down the cracks a little bit, but there's no reason um, that we can't accept this because it's a completely reasonable request um, and mark it as help wanted. And then if, you know, sort of somebody wants to contribute the fix, then I'm sure we'd, we'd look at that and try and get that merged. Any thoughts? Get the decade right this time. Disruption budget, so we must be here. Okay, so this is the system tests. I think we just got some tags wrong. So I'm not sure we've got any of the people that work on the system tests on the call today. Um, but yeah, this is clearly a bug that needs fixing. So this is a problem that I think we've known was we were going to hit at some point, um, which is for historical reasons when we were using um, stateful sets, uh, we put all the um, the different broker um, certificates in a single um, secret that got mounted into the broker pods and then each of them picked out their particular certificate um, and since we've moved to pod sets we've no longer that, got that sort of as a, a limitation that came from the, the pod set API and um, if you're using um, Strimzy at a big enough scale with enough brokers then um, you hit the, the limit on the size of that secret so I think we've already got um, an issue. Yeah, Jakob's commented here um, for fixing this, basically having a, a secret per broker, which would obviously eliminate this as a, a limit. Um, so I think we can close this since it's tracked elsewhere. Unless anyone's got any other thoughts.
only a couple more to go. So at the moment in the API module, we've got um, a whole lot of different classes. Um, some of them are common between um, different CRDs. So the API module for anyone that's on the call that doesn't isn't already aware um, is like the Java representation of the, the CRDs um, that Scrimzy uses. So there's some, some of those classes are sort of in common and some of them are particular to a single CRD and at the moment they're sort of mostly in a, a single package. So I think the suggestion here is we should split it into sub packages for different CRDs and having a common package for those which are common um, which would make the whole thing a lot more um, more easily na navigated and discovered for, for people that sort of um, weren't fully aware of exactly how those different classes map to the, the CRD schemas that Scrimsy uses. Um, so I guess the big thing about this is it would be a, a backward incompatible change for the API module, um, which is never great. I think there are people that are using the uh, the API module, the sort of the Java um, artifact that goes with that, and that we published to Maven, um, and therefore uh, their code will break um, at compile time uh, when they picked up a new version of that API module dependency, um, which is not a great experience for them. Um, the question is whether or not that is um, worth it in terms of the, just the improved maintainability and making Strimzy sort of more easy for people to contribute to. Are there any thoughts that people have about this one? Yeah, there is a question uh, about how many people could be using the API model outside of Strimzy. Uh, so I was looking at the Marvel Central repository and the number are very low. Uh, I don't know if this is indicative or not, but... What do you call a very low number out of interest? Yeah, the, the, there is a, a statistics usages of, of the each version. Uh, you can see that. Uh, maybe I can post in the chat. Um, here. And we are never about five as number there. So it's very low. Okay. At least it's like I don't know if you can see. Yeah, no, I'm I'm having a look. Yeah, so it looks like there's not a lot of use of that API. Yeah. Um, which is fine. Um and I think that sort of helps tip the balance a little bit because if we're not actually going to sort of be breaking um, many people's mm -hmm. um, use of that code then there's clear benefits to the project I think of, of you know trying to make the existing code yes more maintainable but also easier for people to contribute to. I was thinking we could extend this even to the model packages of uh, the other projects like the cluster operator. I was looking into doing it for cruise control um, as well. But I don't know if that's kind of, that would just add to the mess that this, well, uh, this mass of PR. Yeah, I think it's one of those, those things that you can sort of do incrementally um, and over time just sort of Im improve the situation. So shall we, uh, I don't know, this is going to be a, a help wanted. This is the sort of thing where we want to coordinate it quite carefully because it could break um, people's uh, ongoing PRs. Um, so. One question, Tom. Yeah. Would a natural place to make this change be when the Strimsy API goes from beta two to next 
version, you know, V1 or, or whatever, would that be the natural point to um, restructure um, this API? You'd think so. Um, in practice, they're separate APIs and they don't necessarily evolve in the same way. So the way um, APIs evolve in Kubernetes is if you don't provide an upgrade webhook, um, then basically the API server has to be able to convert between the old version of a particular CR and the new version of a particular CR, which really severely limits how you can evolve um, that API. Um, and you sort of think, okay, so the solution to this is to use a, an upgrade webhook. Um, but that is not exactly a panacea either. We looked at this um, last time uh, we migrated some of the APIs and moved to uh, V1, V2. And the difficulty that we had there is, yes, you can write that webhook, but actually installing it um, is quite hard because the um, API server has to um, have a, a TLS trust relationship with that webhook that's you know running within it. Um, and yeah, it's sort of easy enough to sort of do, you know, develop the code to um, yeah, convert a custom resource from the one API version to the other, but actually having people be able to easily deploy it and make use of it is actually quite a barrier. Um, so the way we did it last time is we provided a, a tool um, that people could use to rewrite their APIs, but didn't expose that as a, a webhook because we just felt it was easier um, for people to use it as a tool rather than sort of saying, you know, here are the, here's the existing sort of install mechanism. But before you can actually do that, you've got to go and generate your own um, TLS certificate and make your API server trust the you know, whoever has issued that TLS certificate and set all of that up, it's actually, it's it's quite a lot of hoops, you know, people to, to jump through. Um, whereas just providing a tool to do it was simpler. So sort of getting back to the, the point that you were asking about is um, whatever um, CRD version, um, the the watch is like sort of deserializing into Java, it's going to be the same Java classes that we use, um, because that's the, the mechanism I think that Fabricate has. And so, yes, you can change the custom resource version, but you still got to have a consistent set of Java classes to do so. And so there is that sort of that coupling and therefore adding a new CRD version doesn't really necessarily correlate to having a separate set of packages or, you know, renaming the packages. So a very long winded just, answer yeah. to say, no, I don't think so. Okay. No, I, I just want to add one more thing. What, where my question came from, and I've, I've seen some um, Java APIs back in Kube APIs where they've incorporated the version information into the package name. Yeah, I think yes. Kubernetes itself does that, um, uh -huh. but I think I've seen other, other operators do that as well. I just wondered if that's something we'd want to copy here at some point. I mean, that is an interesting thought, and I must admit I've not... It might be possible through Fabricate to... Uh, um, it's not just Fabricate, again, it's, it's Jackson. Um, I suspect possibly with a possibly using a custom Jackson deserializer, it might be possible to do that sort of thing. Um, so that might be worth investigating, actually. Um, it's a good point that you raised there. Question is how to summarize this conversation.
actually thinking a little bit more i think we have considered this in the past and what um what pushed us away from this was the the fact that we're then in the um the not the api layer but the model layer where we take um those api classes and basically sort of have functions to convert them to things like deployments and um strimsy pod sets and secrets and so forth um it would basically end up duplicating that code because those you'd have to have you know one function that took the the v1 class and another that took the v2 class um and so that was kind of more um yeah you sort of double the surface area of that part of the api and you therefore double the testing that has to go with it um so yes, maybe let's take that out. Yeah, that is um, true. That's what we ended up doing on that on Nmas. Mm -hmm. reasonable summary of what we've talked about yeah that's fine i hate to be pedantic i don't think uh, is maven repository actually giving download stats or is that just references from other public apis this is a fair point. i think it's the latter i must admit i don't know i've never looked so closely at that when you I click through it, show, right. it seems to show you other artifacts which are referring to it. So it brings out things like Debusium test suite. And okay, so that's that's interesting, isn't it? Because if if it's download stats, that's telling you something about you know sort of people who might be using it in a private way. Whereas if it's references, then you can only know about the references from other you know projects which are, you know, effectively open source or at least source access. Um, so we don't actually know about people who might be using it internally within an organization, for example. Um, yeah. Nonetheless, you can probably infer um, from the fact that there are a few number of open source users. I think it would be perverse if there were very few open source users, but lots of, you know, company internal users so i think the yeah. the reasoning still holds oh. Okay, and I think the last one is, um, I think this came from uh, a comment in the, the no pools PR that um, I made. Um, well, we had a, a conversation about it in the PR and we think that we could and probably should um, try to make the the models so not the this is not in the api module but um 
those model classes that we build from the API objects um, and from which we then generate the um, deployments and, and so on um, if we make those immutable um, and possibly turn them into records. So this is kind of like a very, um, I don't think anyone's looked at this in sort of forensic detail to double check that this is definitely possible, but it logically it is how the API is used suggests that this ought to be possible. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I personally think this is worth doing. Again, I think it's the sort of thing that makes the code you know a lot clearer um, and therefore helps people who are new to the code base understand what's going on. Does anyone have any other thoughts about this? Okay. Plus one from me. This is a, a good start and probably not a help wanted either. It probably wants to be um, done by sort of one of the, the regular contributors who can at least sort of see, understand the consequences. Okay, so I think that's all of those. Yes. And so moving back to the agenda, um, that's the issues triage done. Um, so does anyone have any other business they want to bring up? Okay, well, hearing nothing, then uh, thank you all for your time. I uh, hope you found this useful and um, I guess see you around. If not here, then on Slack. Thank you, Dom. Bye. Thanks very much, folks. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks, Tom.